Good morning to everybody. We are here with Mr. Sulima to answer to some questions that remained without uh, answering from our webinar Nature and Agriculture, Understanding EU Policy and Delivering Good Practice. Thank you to Mr. Sulima to be with us again. Thank you very much. Okay, so we start with the first question. What is the link between IPARD, Instrument for Pre-Accession Assistance for Rural Development, Funds and CAP, if there is any, of course? Uh, yes, so when it comes to the E part, so instrument for pre accession which concerns rural development, well, obviously, the, the first and the strongest link is that it's part of the common agricultural policy, it's funded by uh, the common agricultural policy, and the idea behind it is actually to allow uh, candidate countries. Um, or countries who want one day to become member states of the EU to prepare um, uh, their agriculture, their rural uh, areas um, to uh, the moment when they uh, exceed the European Union, when they will have to, um, uh, well, let's put it, let's call it compete on the common market with the farmers from um, uh, other uh, member states. Uh, also to upgrade their, their agricultural and also the uh, pre-accession instruments can be used by those countries to improve their management of environmental and uh, natural resources. Um, so while it's not necessarily, um, I, I mean, the policy linked to E part does not follow exactly the same, let's say, legal framework as uh, member states uh, policy. Somehow the objectives which we uh, also use for E part reflect those which are being implemented by member states in their context, in their legal context. Okay, thank you very much. The second question is again about links between a leader approach and the CAP. Yes, and of course, the leader approach is an integral part of the common agricultural policy. It is already, it has been like that, it is now and it will be uh, in the future. Um, this is, let's say, just one of the ways through which the common agricultural policy objectives can be implemented by member states. And what is important is that it gives much stronger and bigger power for local actors and stakeholders, you know, bottom-up approach. Um, but still the leader and whatever um, those local um, uh, actors or stakeholders do in their leader groups, it has to also contribute to the objectives which are common for common agricultural policy. So that's where the, 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 the link is. And of course, um, the local action groups, uh, so the groups which actually implement the leader approach um, on the ground, uh, they can use various instruments available in rural development in order to achieve the objectives which they're set for their own, uh, let's say, territory, but which are somehow also linked to this overall objective of the CAP. So that's where the link is. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Mrs. Carmen uh, Padurea. In countries where uh, in the management plans for Natura 2000 areas uh, contains me measures for grasslands overlapping with agri-environment conditions. Could the Natura 2000 payments be available in the future? Or we need different conditions that agri env for applying uh, for these measures? Yes, this is, um, this is actually a very important question because um, it's, it's a question which shows or which asks about which tool or which instruments which is available in the CAP and in this context in rural development is more adequate to address the Natura 2000 needs. And here I understand that we talk about the measures concerning grassland uh, in Natura 2000. And member states actually have two uh, options when it comes to the instruments of rural development. Uh, to, to identify, let's say, the tools to help the proper management of uh, grassland area in Natura 2000. Um, so it's, of course, on one side, Natura 2000 payment measure, 
And on the other side, uh, what the question also refers to, agro-environmental measure. And the distinction is quite clear because when it comes to the support linked to Natura 2000 payments, this support under this measure can only be provided for um, compensating the implementation of mandatory requirements. So those are, let's say, the requirements which are legally established and which apply to all beneficiaries in a given uh, Natura 2000 sites. And rural development allows to support the implementation of those requirements. However, when it comes to agro-environment, there only the support can be provided only for what we call voluntary commitments. So those commitments which also serve the purpose of good management of Natura 2000, but which, however, goes beyond those mandatory requirements which can be paid for under Natura 2000, a payment measure. So here, this is exactly the, the factor which makes distinction between the two, whether member states want to actually pay to farmers for respecting the legal obligation, or member states rather uh, would like to pay for more ambitious voluntary commitments also serving the purpose of Natura 2000. Okay, very good. Now uh, we pass it to the question from uh, Mr. Brides. Member states must submit the CAP strategy plans by end of this year. Is this realistic? In Latvia, Ministry of Agriculture has not yet started any formal discussion yet. Yes, so, um, well, that's a very timely question, right? We can all agree. Um, well, the thing is that I, I will start maybe just to say a little bit where we are with the whole process of approving uh, the, the legislation, the legislative framework for the, for the new CAP post-2020. Um, well, as you know, the Commission has presented its proposal already last year in June, and now we are in a phase where uh, co-legislators, so the Council and the European Parliament, they also are looking at this, uh, uh, at this proposal and propose, let's say, the amendments, express uh, their opinion, how they see that this uh, legal framework um, uh, should, look, should look like. Uh, so there are three institutions, let's say, and the uh, which are working on it. Um, and the, of course, the idea is that from the Commission side, we would love to uh, have the, the the legislative framework to be ready by end of this year, so that member states they could already start uh, preparing uh, or even implementing their CAP plans already from the next year. Um, and we hope that. Uh, it will be still possible. We know that it's uh, already quite late. Um, but this, whatever it happens, whether actually the legislative framework will be in place by the end of this year or not, what is important is that member states, they should already start the work on their future CAP plan. For instance, when it comes to SWOT analysis, to identifying their needs, uh, because that's the, the key, uh, let's say, component based on which they will later on establish their intervention, establish their budget, targets, and so on. And regardless of whether the legal framework is in place by end of this year or if there is some delay next year, we can be sure that this component will not change, mm -hmm. that they will really have to start their preparation from, 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 from this level, from identifying their needs for making SWOT analysis, ex-ante evaluations, and so on. Mm -hmm. This is a very important point. So member states have to start to work on this direction. And this is very crucial, I think, yes, for mem absolutely. <laughs> many member states. To avoid also further delays, if there is a delay with legal framework, you know, member states, if they start now with this, uh, with this part of the preparing of the plan, once the legal framework is in place, they, are, they can already start from the second or third stage of preparing it and not from uh, from stage one if they wait for the preparation of the, exactly. of the legal framework. Very important. Thank you very much. Uh, now the last uh, three questions from uh, Mr. Puchalski. The first one is about flexibility. Often there are uh, great differences in local uh, climatic, uh, landscape or ge geological constraints within a region. 
This makes the official specific demands for a payment scheme often of low real impact, irrelevant or even harmful. How this issue will be addressed in the new CAP? Yes, so I think here what is the most important to say is that the new CAP is, um, is aiming at uh, good targeting of the future uh, interventions and the use of the instruments which uh, the CAP provides for. Which means that we are all aware that there are different conditions, uh, not only between the member states, but sometimes even within the same member states, be it ecological condition, geological landscape related when we talk about environmental interventions, but also economic and social. And the, uh, the, the new CAP um, wants actually to um, encourage member states to reflect those differences in the way uh, the interventions are designed or programmed by member states, which means that they uh, should, pro for instance, propose when it comes to environmental actions, different actions depending on how different those conditions are. Uh, so instead of having, for instance, one intervention for the whole territory, just to make a, or to propose interventions which are more targeted to the specific needs or, of a given territory in order to address those specific needs better, but then also to have better outcome and results. Because only by the interventions which really address the existing concrete needs, be it environmental or others, in a given territory, you can propose the intervention which uh, is um, uh, tailored made for those needs. And that's how the result actually can be achieved in terms of improving uh, the problems identified there. And uh, this actually will apply for first and second pillar. Because if the question is also about the payment scheme re referring to the first pillar, like for instance now greening, in the future, with the ECHO scheme in the first pillar, member states are supposed to also have more freedom and flexibility to really not to choose or implement the measures which are common for the whole EU, but they can really propose those uh, management activities for good for the environment, which are really relevant for their specific needs. Thank you. And now uh, another question from uh, Mr. Puraski. Is there any encouragement action planned for the appreciation of traditional ecological knowledge among farmers? Yes, that's, that's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, I think that... Um, um, this is, um, I, I'm, I'm hesitant because actually uh, I think that this is also an issue which should be taken into account perhaps by the authorities when also they propose their agro-environmental interventions. To use also the knowledge of those who really know which practices can work and actually address a given problem. And often we say that that's uh, the role for perhaps uh, researchers or research institutes. But I think that the, the, the knowledge, the very deep knowledge of farmers who actually implement and, and cultivate the land should not be underestimated, but on the contrary, should really be valued at this stage of preparing uh, the interventions. And when it comes to already the, 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 the CAP plan where the measures are proposed, I think that uh, this traditional ecological knowledge of farmers can be very well used in terms, for instance, in the case of the so-called result-based measure. Because that's the, the, the type or the approach for uh, environmental actions which the CAP proposal also promotes. We explicitly refer to the result based that member states should uh, encourage this way of implementing agro-environmental uh, interventions. And what is the result based interventions? They are really about just defining the results which should be achieved, but leaving the space of how these results should be achieved to actually those who to cultivate land, mm -hmm. so to farmers, so that they can use their, their knowledge which they've been accumulating for years of the work, but even for generations, in order to actually do what they know best, what to do and how to do in order to achieve this or that result. So that's where the, the knowledge 
of of uh, of of farmers it's just uh, well it's necessary it's indis mm -hmm. indispensable definitely definitely we hope that the member states will be able to <laughs> to answer to all this uh, demand that the new cap uh, 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 request from uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly it's, it's a complex issue and exactly. but I think that's this is that's why it's important what I said earlier to really start the whole process of thinking about the future plan quite early enough so that there is enough time also to involve other partners so although there is no question about it but when I just started just very briefly that's why the consultation process it's so important of involving the ecological uh, but also socio-economic partners in preparing the CAP plan at the very early stage, for instance, for the SWOT analysis, for the identification of the needs, uh, and so on. Thank you very much for mentioning this point, because it's very crucial, and also for Europark, we are very... Uh, mm, not concerned, but really we consider this point uh, crucial uh, that uh, the new cap, uh, uh, especially member states, need to involve as much as possible all uh, uh, partners and, uh, in our case, of course, uh, manager or uh, protect areas uh, and uh, local farmers mm. in protect areas uh, can have an important role to play in this uh, aspect. Yeah. Last question is, uh, what is the perspective for agri-environmental support based on effect and not only based on action in action? Yes, so this is uh, actually an issue which I uh, just referred to also to re uh, by responding to the previous question. So I will just repeat that um, the, the result-based approach, so focusing on, on, on result, it's something which is very much promoted by the future policy. It also fits very well in the overall approach to the future uh, EU budget on, um, re on focusing on results and seeing really the results of the EU funds being uh, used by member states. Um, so again, by, uh, by all means, member states are encouraged very much to do so, also because we believe that certain uh, environmental issues um, they can only be achieved precisely by not only being ver uh, by very targeted interventions but also the interventions when there is certain flexibility and freedom left to 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 farmers and land managers to implement them uh, still with remembering what the, what are the results and outcome uh, expected uh, from them which means that of course they have to be very well uh, defined uh, as the let's say first stage of the of proposing the uh, the result based but we believe that both the approach based on the result and the approach based like this is now in majority of cases on action they are both equally important they have their place and space in the context of Kaplan when it comes to addressing the environmental needs. It just then it depends where and on what issues uh, this or the other approach uh, should be implemented. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Solima. I thank hope you. that we will have other occasion to dialogue. Thank, thank you, you very much. It was a pleasure. Good morning to everybody. We are with uh, Mr. Jeremy Crespan. Thank you to be with us again to answer to some questions about uh, nature and agriculture, understanding EU policy and delivering good practice uh, that were uh, asked during our webinar. So the first question is about uh, um, strategic nature project that you mentioned. Can you tell us more about this and which is the relation with the LIFE program? Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's a very good question. Indeed, it relates to the LIFE program because the SNAP uh, strategic nature project uh, will be part of the future uh, LIFE program post-2020. If you read the LIFE regulation, uh, the SNAPs are defined as projects which will achieve nature and biodiversity objectives by implementing programs of action in member states, by mainstreaming these objectives and priorities in other instruments, including through the implementation of prioritized action framework. 
So what does it mean? Uh, so you could understand the SNAP as being a strategic operational program for nature uh, that will contain a specific uh, action. And the most important element is that it should be used for mainstreaming, so to further promote uh, integration and funding in other funding instruments. And this is especially important for common agricultural policy. And it uh, also should be used to implement the prioritize action framework. So we expect the measure indicated in the natural frozen prioritize action framework to be implemented through strategic nature project. So SNAP, uh, to be more concrete and to make you more understand, is the successor of the current nature integrated project. So this would be the successor on a wider scale with more money, uh, not limited to PATH because it could also implement a wider uh, uh, green infrastructure. And the beneficiary is uh, uh, the national or regional authorities. It should be used for uh, institutional support uh, to mobilizing, coordinating uh, complementary action from other funds. So this is the objective to have a leverage effect that it can mobilize other funds and multiply the budget with uh, cap uh, funding. And it should be also associated with concrete conservation measures. So it should not only be used for institution building, uh, monitoring and knowledge capacity building, but also complemented to uh, conservation measures. Uh, this SNAPS is uh, indeed uh, an answer from the Commission to the call for the nature funds. So in the life impact assessment, Uh, this option was not considered as uh, efficient and mainstreaming in other funds was uh, uh, option retained. However, a strike nature project was a way uh, to be used to leverage more uh, funds for nature in the other funds. And we have already this taking place in the current uh, uh, strategic nature project. Perfect, thank you very much. The second question from Mr. Pulaski is uh, about Ratura 2000 habitats. There are some uh, Ratura 2000 habitats, lakes, rivers, uh, riverine uh, floodplains, for which their conservation status is in fact much less related to land use or conservation measure on site. Or within Natura 2000 areas, then dependent on often unspecified agri-areas outside protected areas. The regional analysis of groundwater flow patterns, good farming practices, ecotones, and local water retention might help if properly designed and addressed. Is there any action planned to support this direction? Yes. Um, so first we have to to know that uh, conservation measures in natural 2000 are the most important measures uh, used to achieve the objective of uh, cons favorable conservation of habitat or species, but they are not the only one because uh, those species and habitats also occurred outside natural 2000 sites. So obviously, uh, the action in the site should be complemented with agricultural area outside protected area. However, we don't have such strong obligation outside of protected area and the legal framework is uh, not so strong outside. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, no action should occur outside and the CAP specifically does not only focus on natural 2000 but uh, has an objective, a wider biodiversity objective and should be used uh, to this purpose to complement the action in the sites Uh, this is also the objective of the current biodiversity strategy and uh, the component, essential component of the CAP uh, action on high nature value farmland that uh, also occurred outside of the sites. Um, you could also have an action plan within the waterfront directive. Uh, so as regards your uh, 
specific question about local water retention measures that uh, can help and can also be triggered in the measure indicated in the river basin management plan, for example. So this is uh, all uh, possible and uh, action are also uh, needed. Thank you. Other question, and this is a little bit more uh, connected with the CAP, uh, but it's interesting to have uh, your opinion, uh, Jeremy. It's about uh, Pillar 2 and Pillar 1. So if uh, insufficient funding for Pillar 2 is one of the reasons why we are way off from reaching biodiversity targets, how come the budget cuts are for Pillar 2 and not for severe for Pillar 1? What do you think about it? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, first, we have to know that uh, the funding uh, allocated for the environment is not only dependent on the specific need identified to reach the biodiversity target. There are other objectives to achieve uh, for MFF, and the biodiversity objective competes with uh, not only other environmental climate objectives, but other economic and socio-economic uh, objectives. And we also have to face uh, the constraint of uh, the Brexit uncertainty and also the new priorities uh, because CAP and regional policy are considered uh, our old policy and there are new policies that, uh, uh, for which the Commission wants uh, to allocate more budget and resources such as uh, migration or, uh, or security. So that's uh, one of the conclusions. Um, as regards the cap on uh, the budget on Pillar 1, um, I would say that we no, should not focus, forget that there is an uh, eco-scheme that will still be there and can still be used to reach biodiversity target. And the eco-scheme will not have the same constraint as a Pillar 2 measure. It can be paid uh, for top-up uh, payment and uh, payments which are not only uh, linked to additional cost and income for God. So this is uh, an additional possibility and opportunity uh, that hopefully uh, could be, if good, well used, could uh, lead to reaching biodiversity targets. Other question again about uh, CAP and the monitoring and control levers. In the proposed CAP, uh, this uh, aspect uh, is not very strong. How will you ensure a member state really deliver on that higher ambition for climate environment? Well, what is important in the proposed cap is that you have stronger link uh, to environmental legislation and policy. So this means that the uh, cap strategic plan, uh, even if the control and monitoring level of the Commission will be lower because of increased subsidiarity, however, they have to rely on environmental plan uh, linked to environmental legislation, and I specifically refer to the plan linked to the nature legislation, which are prioritized action framework, natural and management plan, species action plan. So we expect that much more focus will be uh, done on the CAP strategic plan to deliver on those plans an objective, and that's uh, for us a very uh, important component. Uh, which, combined with the safeguard on conditionality, would lead to uh, increased ambition for uh, nature and biodiversity. Thank you very much. Again, uh, from uh, Europark perspective, uh, I have to say that uh, we are uh, happy to see uh, that Member States uh, will have more possibility to adapt uh, the measures to their uh, local realities. But at the same time, uh, we are a little bit afraid that uh, the member state will be really able to respect all these uh, um, requests that uh, are connected with um, environment protection and either ambition of a new cap. So we really hope that the Commission will be very strict about this when uh, uh, he will, uh, when the Commission will evaluate the Member States' uh, strategic plan about this. So uh, another question was about uh, um, 
Cup è Natura 2000, uh, however in many countries, region, the action within the Cup or Natura 2000 are based on some rigid fit to all instructions, norms without understanding of world complex system functions, interrelations, feedbacks, regional or local context, a need for adaptive management, important when facing climate and social change. How do policies are planned to improve more interactive approach? Mm -hmm. I think this is also connected with the previous yes. <laughs> uh, question. Uh, so if there are rigid uh, top-down approach in some country, it might be also some country which have been less experienced uh, with the CAP. So maybe in the first accession of new member states, this could uh, happen. However, no, they have more experience and they should be able to tailor more specific measures uh, which are uh, more tailored to local needs, especially with the uh, new emphasis on having more subsidiarity for CAP strategic plan. Um, what we really think important for us is the environmental planning tool and a specific uh, prioritization action framework and at a local level natural thousand management plan, which really Uh, should indicate uh, the measures which are needed at local, as a local level, identified according to local needs, and the policy should uh, uh, fund and support the measures identified at local needs. So that's how I see that uh, the policy uh, should be made a better role to funding and correspond to local needs. However, this approach is uh, member state subsidiarity. Uh, it's uh, the choice of member state. However, the Commission should still, uh, when approving the STAP strategic plan, ensure that uh, this approach is uh, contributing well to supporting our policy and nature and biodiversity policy. Thank you. And now, uh, a last question that Mr. Jeremy received from uh, Slovenia by email after uh, our webinar, and I think it's a very, very important uh, question. Which kind of support from DG Envy member states can receive in implementing the new green architecture of the CAP after 2000 and about the guidance, the guidelines, and advice? Yes, so what's the role of DG Environment? So first, we are working with uh, DG Agriculture uh, in uh, explaining uh, the CAP proposal and the interpretation of the article because there are many links with environmental legislation, so you have to know what, what uh, it means and especially what are the environmental planning tools for biodiversity and nature. So we are in this process of explaining this. And especially, um, we have uh, published a certain number of guidance and frequently asked questions. So in my presentation, is, I think it's the last slide when you have some links. So I could mention especially um, the frequent asked questions on prioritized action frameworks that are uh, available on our site and you have many Uh, questions that uh, were asked during the financing seminar of uh, DG Env that uh, took place in uh, every member state. Uh, so this is uh, very relevant and useful. We have the farming guidance, natural thousand and farming, uh, which is also uh, relevant. So we plan a further update of this, uh, taking into account uh, the new cap. Uh, we have also some seminars, specific seminars, so I would mention the ENRD uh, seminar, which was specifically uh, addressing biodiversity issues in the new CAP. So uh, there is a report available and the presentation of uh, ENRD website, so this is a very good source of information. I would also mention the previous seminar on ENRD and Natural 2000, which is, was more focused on uh, Natural 2000, so this was a specific deliverable of the Nature Action Plan. Um, DG and also uh, contribute to the guideline of DG Agri, so when there are fish uh, pro provided or leaflets, we contribute, and uh, especially we have given hypothetical example of a uh, scheme for nature and biodiversity uh, that can be used uh, in the new CAP model. 
uh, uh, green architecture model. I would also mention that we have a big action on uh, large carnivore with uh, leading on the platform on large carnivore with several guidance document issues which are online and one specific about is about the potential of use of rural development funds uh, to uh, support uh, coexistence. Uh, we have also a specific guidance that we have done. It's a uh, following a new pilot project a request from the European Parliament is a specific guidance on result-based uh, payment scheme. We have currently three uh, uh, pilot grant project ongoing, uh, which will be likely to be finished uh, this year, and we plan to organize a conference on result-based payment uh, scheme. We should further use this work, good practice and experience to further promote and have a better uh, integration of a scheme into the CAP strategic plan is also uh, fits into the approach of uh, result-based uh, policy. Uh, I would also mention the initiative we have on Pollinator, which has a certain interaction with the CAP, with some uh, guidance, and we also have a contract which will analyze the current integration and uh, Pollinator action into the CAP and will also uh, have some results to uh, also include more specifically pollinator measure in the future. And at last, we are also involved in the current evaluation on biodiversity and CAP, uh, which uh, DGN is clearly uh, involved, and this uh, evaluation will be available at the end of the year, and it will fit uh, on the current evaluation of the biodiversity strategy and will be used to prepare the ground for the post-2020 uh, strategy. Super. Thank you very much, Mr. Crespon. I think that this uh, overview was very, very useful for everybody. And we finish here. Thank you again uh, to be able to answer to all these questions. And uh, looking forward to meet again. Thank, Thank you. you for your invitation.